And welcome! Hello! Hello, good friends. Thank you for hanging out with us today. Welcome to Deckard Games Club, where the topic is... No hat needed. No hat needed <laughs> until dawn is what the topic is. What's going on, everybody? Welcome and thank you for being here. I got my, I got, this, is my this is my Matt cosplay. Looks good. Uh, he's my favorite character. I don't know if you could tell. Um, <laughs> but anyway, how's everybody doing? Are you ready? Until Dawn is a branching narrative game that Amelia and I have streamed actually more than any other game on our channel ever. Except. Except the Trevor Camus. Yes. yes. Um, Kefka, what's going on? Hey! Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know Kefka loves this game. Big yes! hug, Kefka. Good to see you, friend. Thank you for being an awesome mammal. We appreciate you. <laughs> okay, Sauce, welcome back. Six months. Hello. Yes. So, Amelia, tell our good friends if they've never been to a games club before, why are we doing this? Well, Deckard Games Club is an idea that we came up with because we want to talk about our most favorite games. What makes them so special? Really just get into it and talk about what makes them so but good. But why? But why, you ask? Because Brian and I are developing a video game. <laughs> what? A video game? Yes. Isn't that really hard? Yes. <laughs> Isn't that something we've never done before? Yes. Isn't it something we're going to need all of your help to accomplish? So we're talking about what are our favorite things about our favorite games, what makes them work so well. <laughs> I didn't actually spit on the monitor. It was, it was comedy. It was comedy. I did one comedy once and I laughed once, but uh, Amelia and I have our notebooks ready. Notebooks presented. Uh, thank you, Jade, for my awesome Zelda notebook. I love it. Um, we are excited to be exploring what are your favorite things about Until Dawn mm -hmm. and to get your, your goodly input. Um, thank you all for hanging out with us. I see one little hair. Let me, there you go. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Good looking out. Good Welcome. looking out. Mm -hmm. um, and Guinea Bees, thank you for these cheers. Um, today is International Nutella Day. So write that down in your journals, everyone. Did anyone bring anything to take notes? Uh, if you have any game developer ideas inside of you, we also did a curiosity chill on what are the seven stages of game development. And uh, right now we're in the planning phase, which is yeah. the first phase that moves into pre-production, which we're excited to get to someday, but not yet. Not we're still in the planning yet. phases. Um, Deviant Vinny, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for hanging out with us. Yeah, there's a whole day for Nutella, apparently. I um, did not know as that. As there should be. Um, yeah. Yo, uh, we're going to get into everything about this game. We're going to talk about the characters. We're going to talk about the story. We're going to talk about... The game uh, mechanics. The game mechanics that we like. Um, and we're going to also uh, let everybody know that this is a spoiler-safe stream so yes. don't worry about saying anything that we might not know it's okay we've played the game three times mm -hmm. uh we did a blind playthrough on twitch that's up on our youtube right now we also did a uh keep everybody alive playthrough that we barely pulled off yes. that was pretty cool mm -hmm. um and we also did a everybody dies playthrough that we have a compilation of on our youtube that yes. felt a little weird mm -hmm. but we did it we did it yeah. um oh my pie uh i'm not just saying that that's their username thank you for subscribing um and scorpio inc Thank you for being here and subscribing as well. I see yeah. Glowing Tigers back for 37 Ooh, months. Welcome. And Mr. Debo is old and stuff. <laughs> he's old and stuff and he's back for 45 months. What, what? Listen, 45 months of tolerating my existence is impressive. <laughs> Only Amelia has beat that record, Debo. <gasps> oh, I also see Amidala716 <laughs> is back Ooh. for 42 months as well. Back for 42 months. My thank love. you to our moderators and to our lieutenants who help us out. And uh, and thank you all for, for being so grateful for their support. We really I appreciate you, mods and lieutenants, and uh, our whole team on Discord. You guys are great. So I guess a good question to start off asking um, is, how many, uh, who Pull here it? has played Until Dawn? Um, have you played it once? Have you played it multiple times? Have you seen it played? Or do you not know anything about why we have to wait until dawn? <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'm going doing, uh, I have seen, I have played it once. I have seen it played. Um, multiple times. I have times. played it multiple times or what or is this game i have platinum okay or 100% or like you know you're an expert mm -hmm. uh, uh, i am a pro until dawn or i am lost where is my mind mind where's my mind where i am lost where is my mind, mind. There we go. There it is. Type a one in the chat if you have played this game once. Number two in the chat if you have seen it played. Number th or some of it. You know, you're, you're, you're familiar, but maybe not, uh, you know, fully through. Number three, if you have played it multiple times, uh, we have, that would be us. Uh, if you have platinum, type a four in the chat. If you are a pro, if you are an expert, we need to know where our experts are for this one. And number five, 
if you are lost and you don't know where your mind has gone, that's okay. You're in good company because there's about 10 or 11% of us that feel that way today. Yeah. Handsome Jessica, yeah. welcome back for 42 months, my friend. And damn it, Janet. Damn it, Janet. Thank you for being here for 13 months. That's their name too. Ash Pax is back for six months. I'm grateful for you. And uh, Carol, Anders wife, thank you for being here and resubscribing. Uh, also, just a real quick moment to say thank you to all of our awesome subscribers. Thank you all for supporting our channel. Amelia and I are streaming right now four times a week. We do do uh, notification squad bonus streams uh, that we don't post about on social media. So make sure you got your notifications on. And it's worth mentioning that tomorrow and Sunday is the Oh, oh, wrong button, <laughs> is the finale of Mass Effect. We are going to be playing, uh, this is actually incorrect, we're going to be playing it from noon Pacific, our usual Saturday, Sunday time. Um, we did some extended streams last weekend, but Mass Effect 3 will be completed, the whole Legendary Edition, on this Saturday and Sunday. Nice. Hey, Sick Parvis, 87, hey. welcome back for 40 months. Thank Good you so much you. for your incredible support. Sick Parvis Magna. Yes. I'm going to yell that every time you resubscribe. <laughs> Thank you for hanging out. Uh, appreciate you all. And, and Lisbon, 333, how you doing? Welcome back for three months. Thank you for being here, Laguna. Thank you for the cheers. It looks like we've got... Uh, a, okay, so majority of you have seen it played, and then we've kind of split the other 50% of us, 52% of us, over the rest of it. But we have a good number of experts here. That's good. Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, people who have played it multiple times, people who are pros of this game, um, it's okay. And uh, in the chat, you may see a spoiler or two if you're not as familiar. But we really want to open this game up. We're going to crack it open and see how it works see what we like about it, what is the most successful element of this game. And um, we can also discuss a little bit the Dark Picture Anthology, but that's going to be its own uh, games club, we do believe. Yeah. Scorpio Inc., thank you hey, for the five gifted subs. Scorpio Inc., thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. Thanks for hanging out with us. And yes. thank you for your generous support. If you got one of those gift subs, be sure to check out the starter kit. We got a button that looks like this uh, down below the video or a link to mods will share in the chat. It'll show you the way around to go say what's good to Jericho and Zen Garden, our two uh. subscriber chats where they keep it real odd. Well, I'm glad Fubuka Games says that they have waited a week for this stream. I'm so happy. Nice. So um, Games Club is great. And I every <laughs> time we have done it's one- It's great. We've, Which we did Detroit Become Human and Resident Evil. Those are up on our YouTube right now. I have felt incredibly inspired afterwards and we've had really good brain jams. So something that I love about Until Dawn, because this is one of the first games that we played, is it is a branching narrative. So the choices that you make shape the story. And it essentially, the story is kind of like a scary movie where a whole bunch of friends go away for a weekend to a big house in the woods and death occurs <laughs> and creepiness occurs. Death and occurs, but like kind of tragic death. Yeah. It's not just your regular old death. It's your bully into death off a cliff type situation. Yeah. You all know that one. Yeah, and uh, and then it is up to you and the choices that you make as you direct each of the characters who lives and who dies. Yes. And you have until dawn for it all to go down. So I personally really love how... Uh, as a player, you get to direct the story, essentially. You're very much in control of, of what happens to these characters, how their relationships either um, get stronger or get more detached. Um, and there's also this, this uh, element of dread and fear and darkness. <laughs> almost, almost constant dread. Yeah. Uh, honestly, the, the game uh, starts us off with kind of a dark feeling and doesn't let go. Uh, it's a big part of, I think, uh, the audience for this game. I think that, that, generally speaking, friends, would you say that that you like scary games? Like, would you prefer a game to be scarier? Or do you want a game to uh, keep you nice and safe? Uh, yeah, the tension is very high very in this game, high. Damn Deviant. Yeah, a lot of friends. Uh-huh. Friends. Right, we have friends. some frenemies. Mm, a lot of frenemies. Uh, and so they've, they've all met back up a year later after this tragic event. And, and so... One, uh, you know, sparing you the recap, because most of you are familiar, it seems. Mm -hmm. uh, about 90% of you uh, know what's going on. Um, the uh, question I have to start off with, and then we're going to break this into categories based off what you all think. So you're all driving and we're here to learn from you. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite element of 
until dawn. What do you think works the most? What's your favorite aspect or part, component? Shout them out and then we're gonna pull them all together. Yeah. Um, your, choices your choices matter. matter. Okay, your choices yeah, right. matter. Until down. Down? Yeah, until down. <laughs> Dawn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's scary. The, okay. okay, it's scary. That's a very good one. I'm going to pull all these. We're going to take the top. Um, you don't need to necessarily say everything you're saying out loud because they're making me a little confused. My the pen, pen is dead. My pen is dead. Oh, no. Oh, Where's my. the chapstick? This is not a pen. Okay, it's scary. The buildup of tension. Okay, tension, 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 tension. Variety of characters. And um, you're gonna have plenty of time to write this down, babe, because we're gonna put it up as a poll. Okay. Um, variety uh, of characters. The um, clues and totems. Clues and totems, nice. Plot. I saw I saw also the unexpected twists. Yeah, plot twists. Um, the lore. Okay. Um, a diverse cast. Okay. And um, nice, nice. It's got a great cast, a lot of good the actors. The world of so like the, the setting. Of, okay, the setting. Um, also, I see the game mechanics, like the don't move, the matching of the heartbeats, the quick time events. Um, yeah, so interesting mechanics, game mechanics. All right. Um, um I'm gonna go with those because those, those are the top ones. Um, that are standing out. Uh -huh. um, we can we can get into more of these later. I just know that if I put more than 10 objects on this thing, it, we run out of space, as you can yeah. finally see. Okay, friends. So what, in your opinion, is one of the best things about Until Dawn? Is it one, that your choices matter? Two, that it's scary. Three, tension, tension, tension. Four, variety of characters. Mm. Five, the clues and totems that you find. Six, the unexpected plot twists and turns. Seven, the lore. What went down all those years ago? Yeah, uncovering the mystery. Eight, the diverse cast. Yep. Nine, the setting and the world of. Okay, the cat cabin in the woods. Or is it ten, the game mechanics, like the quick time events and the don't move and your choices. Yeah, like literally how the game is played. I saw some of you saying like the 360 camera. Um, we got Emmy K. Sama. Thank you for being here for 38 months in a row. While you all pull, uh, let me just say thank you to Stephanie. Hey. Hello. Thank you for... Thank you very much for the raid. Come on in, raiders. Welcome to the channel. We are discussing Until Dawn and yes. what do we love about it most. Blue Rose Raid. What's going Ooh, on? Love hello, that. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Uh, TC Gamer, thank you very much for these cheers. We're grateful to have mm. you here. And Stephanie, thank you for being here for six months. Okay, so let me write these things down. Okay. You, you get it, babe. You write those things down. Those things which are not recorded in any other way. I like having my notebook. Does anybody else want to? Matter. Does anybody else want to uh, drop in their answer on this poll? Uh, let's give it ten more seconds to do so. And Trish, thank you for being here and resubscribing. Sheriff Johnny Cage, welcome back for a year and a half. And Blue Crusher, Blue Crusher is back for thirty-eight months. Thank you for supporting our channel. Notes matter. Notes matter. Notes I agree. Notes matter. Yeah. I, however, just have this uh, bod. And I will review the digital version. Um, All right. Did plout twist. So the the winner here is very clearly that your choices matter. Why don't we write down the ones that? That's win? what I'm. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm writing the top three. Okay. <laughs> Prove it. Your choices matter. Okay, so over 55% of you say that that is the single most important aspect of this game. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like the second one is the lore. That's true. The lore is, I think, to me, something that really helps me replay it, you know, and uh, jump back into the game and, and want to discover more, even if I've already done a path through. Yep. Um, and then it uh, looks like it's a tie between the variety of characters, which I think is also mixed with the diverse cast. It's just we got it up there kind of twice. And the game mechanics, like the quick time events, uh, the don't move. Uh, yeah, yeah. Variety of characters. Okay. You about to tell my Android brain I got the percentages <laughs> wrong? No, I just read it wrong. Okay. A variety of characters. My Android. I'm a set by Cyber Life and everything. All right, so we're going to discuss your top categories. The unexpected twist is an honorable mention, I think, that's, yeah. that is kind of built into the lore, perhaps. Mm. 
Um, this is very, very good intel, everybody. Um, Mary Marson, thank you for the cheers. And Zabar G, thank you for the resub. Welcome back. <laughs> um, okay, so your choices matter. Let's okay. start there. Um, choices. Your choices matter. Awesome. And they do, in real life too. Yes. Um, let's see. <laughs> Let's see what's going on specifically with the your choices matter aspect of this game. Yeah. How do you know? Yeah. How do, how you, do know? you tell? How can you tell that your choices matter and that they're not just like for, for fun? Yeah. What is it? What is it that makes it stick out that that is the thing that matters the most? Oh, the butterfly effect. Okay. Right. The butterfly effect is built in from the beginning. So when you make a choice, the butterfly happens and you're like, ooh, something I did there made a difference. People die. Nasty is saying people die. So like life or death consequences. Mm -hmm. Consequences. Nice. Um, you can change the relationships between several characters. So I'm gonna call that evolving relationships. Mm -hmm. um, Cause a number of you are saying that right now, relationships and what else? Um, uh, immediate consequences. Immediate consequences. Um, is it true that all the playable characters can live or die? Is there any character in this game that is has plot armor and can't die? Or can they literally... Did we kill literally all of them in our death run? I think so. Wow, that's cool. All of the characters can die. That's, that's a thing. Um... Subtle lines, like, I wish I could have done something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um... Subtle dialogue lines. Foreshadowing or uh, dialogue uh, that um, kind of includes uh, uh, the branch. Um, yeah, they can all die because we were mission successful. Yeah, that was a weird That was a weird stream, team. That's weird. It was weird. Uh, but it was a lot of fun to do it. Mm -hmm. um, two of them can make it to the end, but but all of them could die off in the cut. Co co yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, right, Mike and Sam have plot armor until the very end. Yeah. Nice, nice. The therapist scolds you. Yeah, breaking the fourth wall. Mm. Um, the fourth wall is a theatrical term we use for uh, this right here. If, we're if, breaking the fourth wall. We're breaking wall. the fourth wall right now. If Amelia and I were to do a play and, or, or to do a, a scene, we're, we're, acting is mostly nodding at each other. But if we pretended like we were stuck in this world and that you were not even there and you're just watching in mm -hmm. through uh, the theatrical conceit, as they say, you're in the audience, this means the fourth wall is intact. But since we're breaking this fourth wall, uh, that's when the therapist is talking to you. And Unmimir, un we have played this game three times and today we're talking about it. So that's what we're up to today for Games Club. This is really helpful, team. Really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like Chloe in Detroit Become Human. She breaks the fourth wall. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. She's talking right to you about the choices that you made. Okay. Um, good thing to bring that up. Thank you for mentioning that, actually. Yeah. Um, you love the therapist? Cool. All right. We'll get into the characters for sure. Uh, we'll kind of uh, break it in half. Is it really a fourth wall uh, or is it a three and a half wall? Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Because we are still in the story world because he's talking to us as the character. Mm -hmm. But we don't really know who the character is, so it feels like he's talking right to us until we learn yeah. later in the story who he's talking to. So I'd mm -hmm. consider it breaking the fourth wall, but you're right. It does. It still does make uh, make itself into it. Um, uh, no, Matt, we are uh, discussing our playthrough of Until Dawn today. We're not going to actually be playing the game on this stream. Uh, we have three playthroughs of it. Uh, under our belts and two of them are up on our YouTube channel if you do want to watch yes. uh, if you want to watch along like that and Zoe B welcome for 14 months back thank you thank you thank you I'm going to pop these six up this seems okay. like the, a good base of it so of these choices that matter which ones do you think are the most uh, effective which ones are your favorite how do ones? you how do you feel the sensation as the player that your choices really matter. Is it the butterfly effect? So when you make a choice, you see a visual um, uh, cue on screen to let you know that you did something that's gonna have a big impact? Is it the life or death consequences that literally if you mess up a quick time event or if you opt not to help somebody, you will see them die or you see them live? Um, is it that you can evolve the relationship so that little like 
cue that happens that relationships are going up and relationships right. are going down. Right. And then you can go to that other page to see like how your relationship is evolving. Is it the immediate consequences, which I guess are kind of like the... Um, no, no, because the the there are what I'm going to call latent consequences. You could play, you could play a game where you make a choice in The Witcher, you know, four hours into the game, and then eighty hours later, it goes, oh, because you did this thing so long ago, it's going to make an impact. Versus if you do something now, and cause yeah. and effect, like directly. I guess it's a little bit tied to the butterfly effect, but in my mind, butterfly effect is kind of more surreptitious and a little bit more indirect. Whereas immediate consequences is like, you failed the con, you, like, you failed like the Like when, when, you, when uh, you have the option to put your hand into that, into that little mechanic and either you lose oh, the hand or yeah, you don't. Oh yeah, exactly. Oh, that's horrible. I know. Um, also <laughs> Luke Lemon, thank you so much for the raid. Come on in Raiders, come yeah, on in. Yeah, the bear trap. Yeah, the bear trap, that was horrible. Um, is it the force? Is it the foreshadowing and the dialogue that in, d indicates possibilities of like, I could have made a difference or I should have, I would have, I could have. Right. Or, or in the Telltale games where they're like, um, uh, so-and-so will remember that, mm -hmm. right? And it pretty much tells you like, you made a choice. Mm -hmm. Also, in in Until Dawn, we see the actual butterflies yeah, that's, on the screen. That's like, the butterfly effect. That's like, I know, but the butterfly effect is a greater concept. But it also is like when you make a choice, there's a butterfly and it goes. And so you have a visual cue of like, oh, I just did something. Right. It tells you like, dear player, you just did something. You just did something. <laughs> <laughs> um, or is it the breaking of the fourth wall? The therapist who talks to you about your choices and asks you questions. I wouldn't have done that. I'm going to teethily smile at you. Mm hmm. Okay, so it seems right now that the life and death consequences are your top. Yeah, does anybody else want to jump in on there? Let's go for it. Um, it has to be a good butterfly effect that really changes the story, says Marina. Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to have like, uh, you know, you push a button and something comes out the other side. It does, it's not a whole lot of fun if you push a whole bunch of buttons and then some other kind of stuff happens. You want to feel like if I push this button, that happens. If I push mm -hmm. this button... That happens. That's kind of where I'm at on it. Um, Pop yeah. Khaki, thank you for being here for five months. Appreciate you. Yeah, welcome. Um, and Low Tick, uh, thank you very much for being here with your Prime. By the way, if y'all have Amazon Prime like this, you can link it to Twitch for a free subscription with exclamation point free in the chat. There's a panel that looks like this down below the video that is clickable. Mm. So AL has a point saying that um, except the differences in the Telltale games and Until Dawn is that your choices actually matter in Until Dawn most of the time. Telltale says it but it doesn't necessarily have an impact further along in the game you know we haven't replayed any of the until dawn or i'm sorry any of the uh telltale games yeah. the one i think that i would start with replaying would be the wolf among us same, same um i really enjoyed playing the wolf among us we have a playthrough of that on our youtube too if you want to watch it but the uh that's the one that we you know i i i, I do feel like having that alert go off gives me a sense of it but it's kind of abstract. It feels yeah. a little indirect. Okay, so definitely the life and death consequences are your favorite mechanic to show you that your choices matter. So you are literally controlling who lives and who dies based on your choices, which I think is a very effective way to, to give the player a sense of agency because your choice will literally shape who makes it yeah, to the yeah. end. Uh, I see uh, Pretty uh, 1988 has a good point about the non-immediate consequences being satisfying because you can't just immediately load back your previous save. Mm -hmm. You know, if you did something and then it affects something that happens in six scenes, then you got to play the whole game again if you want to make that adjustment. Yeah. Uh, Marina says, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? <laughs> yes. It has been zero days since a Hamilton reference on this stream. And by the way, if you haven't watched Tick, Tick, Boom, we watched that last night. It broke our hearts and we're still dealing with it. Devastated. Uh, Devastated. Such, such a good film. Wonderful music. Um, if you're a big fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda's work, uh, that film really... And Jonathan Larson, yeah, who did Rent. Of course. Uh, that song broke... That whole thing broke my heart. Yes. Life and Death Consequences is number one, and that is the winner. And then Butterfly Effect... Um, and number three was... Is the evolving relationships. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. So really, 
the relationships and life and death consequences. I mean, life and death consequences is so much stronger in this game mm -hmm. and in this poll than the evolving relationships. And in a lot of games, I think the romancing and the relationship options like get talked about a lot, you know, but I think that really if someone's dead, it's hard to romance them. <laughs> well, so. also this story is so much about who lives and who dies because if I can compare it to a, a film, it would be like a scary, it would be a scary movie. Um, and in a lot of scary movies, there's death. And so having this, this is such a crucial part of the storytelling of, uh, of Until Dawn. And like a slasher it. movie. It's, a, it's the genre of yeah. the thing. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of genre, can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. Can, we, can, can I ask for, you know, I know that this crew in particular is here for Until Dawn discussion. So... When it comes to a genre, and a genre being like a kind of category, where do you find it on the shelf? How do you explain it quickly? Like, this is a Western, or this is a horror movie, or this is a sci-fi, or this is high fantasy, or whatever. What are your favorite kinds of genres in general? If you are going to uh, pick up a, a game off the shelf, mm. or a story of any kind. Um, Jonathan Larson is the, uh, uh, the creator of the musical Rent, uh, who wrote all of the music, and... Yeah created Rent, the musical. Uh, also, Vichelia has a good point, too. Um, everything that happens in Until Dawn is related to the fact that the two twins died year a year ago. Um, so it's not just for monsters and stuff, but it has consequences based on choices that were made at the beginning of the game that we didn't really have control over. It was like that that was going to happen no matter what. Right, right. It, this, it, it was a catalyst of the story. In storytelling, it's called the inciting incident. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that happens that sends you on the way. Like, uh, you know, um, uh, basically, uh, you know, Bilbo fine, or, well, I mean, Bilbo in, in The Hobbit has the ring, right, for the first time. And then the rest of the adventure kicks you off, the catalyst, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, we got a lot of good options here about different uh, mm -hmm. genres. Let me type them all in here. Um, I'm seeing uh, give horror. Me, yeah, got horror, got a, uh, adventure. Adventure, I'm putting action and adventure is kind of the same mm -hmm. category. That's like your exploration and your uh, your fight. Okay. Um, uh, murder mystery, like detective. Okay, I got mystery up there, yeah. Uh, psychological thrillers. Thriller. Thriller. Um, I am seeing... Um, RPGs. Okay, I'm going to put uh, role-playing games. Mm-hmm. Uh, and puzzles. How about puzzle games? All right. We're going to drop up these oh, here. Comedy. <laughs> comedy? You didn't even have the comedy on there. Oops. Yeah, comedy is a great genre that we totally missed out. Speaking of, are there any really, really great comedy games? Why do I feel like I don't, I can't think of a game that calls itself a comedy game? I don't know. Saints, Saints Row? Row? Saints Row is popping up? I haven't played that one. I don't know about it. What is comedy? Well, let me know. Favorite genres. Type it in the chat. Number one in the chat for a mystery. Number two for a horror. Number three for fantasy. Number four for sci-fi. Number five for adventure or action adventure. Number six for the season of the thriller. Number seven, role-playing games. And number eight, give me some puzzles. Mm. Ronin of Skyrim. Thank you very much for the cheers. You like a mishmash of horror? Yeah. Oh, this one is a part part teen movie. Part mm. yeah, part slasher. Yeah. Yeah, teen movie like a coming of age kind of story. Um, Bubbly Nugget. Thank you for being here for 14 months. Thank you all for giving us the good input in the chat. So just out of curiosity, this favorite genre is that for anything or for games in particular? I mean, whatever. What 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 draws you to a thing? Where what world do you want to be in? I mean, we're obviously talking about games with Games Club, but if you're just I mean, for me, it's pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Like, I like fantasy, and I like adventure, and I like sci-fi. I'd put those kind of as my personal top genres, and those are the things that I lean to if it's a movie or a book or a TV show. Like, it's kind of like my... It's like escapism. Okay, so it know? seems that a role-playing role game is taking the uh, lead right now. Yeah, that's followed interesting. Followed by horror and fantasy. No, no, adventure. Follow so, role-playing... Or adventure fantasy. Fantasy. 
Nice, nice, nice. Bubbly Nugget, thank you for the gifted sub. Appreciate that very much. Hey, thank you very much. Oh, Bubba. I forgot to mention, by the by, uh, that we have a prize uh, that we're giving away on today's stream. I totally forgot about it. There it is. It's a Blue Yeti microphone, just mm -hmm. like the one that we use to talk to you. But instead, ours has a mustache. Yeah. I recommend you put a mustache on yours when you win it. Uh, but it won't come with a mustache because it's going to be shipped to you from Blue Microphones. But thank to them for this prize. And all you got to do is be here. Um, we'll pull the winner uh, in the next uh, hour block. And uh, we can give five times entry to anybody who's a subscriber and ten times entry to those who are gift sub givers. So thank you, Bubbly Nugget. You're entered in ten times for our Blue Microphone. Yes. All right, I'm going to pause this one here. Do you want to write that down? But let's talk about, then let's discuss some role-playing games because... This is a conversation when Amelia and I have been talking about, uh, yes, our microphone is a gentleman, a true gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, Amelia and I have been discussing this when it comes to this game uh, that we are hypothetically, not hypothetically, that we are quite literally making and it feels like it's blown my mind a little bit. Um, I'm going to change this up to role playing games because you all just uh you're directing us a little bit here to lean into the role playing role playing game. games followed by horror. Uh, yeah, I see horror, I see adventure, fantasy. I mean, those are the winners. Okay. Uh, Sci-fi was close to fantasy, but fantasy definitely wins. All right. um, and, and mystery is yeah, in the running, but didn't win. Um, so when we're talking about role-playing games, because a role-playing game could be in any genre. So I, 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 you could play a role-playing game in sci-fi, you could play a role-playing game in horror world, you know, any kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to an RPG a role-playing game, like Until Dawn, we're role-playing as a bunch of different characters, yes. kinda. Yeah, yeah. Right? So it's like a diorama role-play versus yeah. if you play The Witcher or if you're playing as Horizon, Horizon you're Aloy or you're Geralt, right? So can I do a poll here when it comes to role-playing stories? story games because that's what we're sticking to is that we're definitely building a narrative based game Bending right? narrative, yeah. um would you prefer to control a single character mm -hmm. asari has an interesting point yeah. isn't every game a role-playing game kind of yeah i mean i mean presumably if there's a protagonist that you identify with and you're making choices as then yeah i would say that uh, like Crash Bandicoot, I'm not going to call a role-playing game because Crash is going to do the same stuff, platforming and hopping along left to right and jumping over stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. But a role-playing game um, would allow for me to um, control, inhabit and control yeah. on the character's the, choices. It's your character. Um, but, okay, so role-playing story games. A single character to role-play, uh, two characters to role-play, or an ensemble, so I'm gonna say like three or more characters, mm -hmm. um, three or more to role play. Because like in Detroit Become Human, you're controlling three main protagonists. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're playing uh, The Last of Us Part Two, we have two main protagonists. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're this Until against. Dawn, we are controlling an ensemble, so we are getting to uh, make choices for multiple different characters because it's not we're not driving as one. Um, instead, we're getting to flip between uh, like four or five different characters. Right. So to articulate it a little further for anyone who's kind of on the fence about it, because of course it depends on your mood, it depends on the game. But if you're playing a game with a single character to role play as, it's your character's relationships and reactions to the NPCs, the non-player, the non-player characters, versus something more like option number three, you're determining each of those characters' relationships to each other and uh, you know, the other playable characters. So yeah. it's basically player character and non-player characters, or is it your playable characters with other playable characters? Mm -hmm. um, fantastic. Uh, this is cool. Goblin Queen, thank you very much for the gifted sub. Appreciate hey, that. Hey, thanks, Goblin. Uh, and Silver Roses, thank you for the cheers. And... Miru Ify, thanks for being here for three months. And Deviant Holy Alec. shit, no way. It, what, would be, it would be Jonathan Larson's birthday today. He would be 62 years old. That's, wow. I know. Wow, wow, wow. wow. Devastated. Um, Devastated. Uh, okay. Um, 
I see, I Alec, see. Alec, Deviant Alec, greetings to you in Germany, and thanks for joining us for 14 months. Hello, hello. Oh, there's also multiplayer RPGs like Beyond Two Souls. Beyond Two Souls, you control two characters at the same time. Yeah. Which you could, well, or I guess you could alternate, so you could play as one, one person controlling both Jody and Aiden, or in our case, Amelia was Jody mm. and I was Aiden. Dragon Cat says that uh, they thought that Until Dawn had too many characters because it was hard to keep them straight. I definitely think that having very distinctly different characters, if you are going to do an ensemble, is very important so that you're not confusing who everybody is. Like yeah, different names, yeah. different looks, very different energy. That's a good point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good point. And you know, um, just because we're talking about super massive games and the Dark Picture Anthology uh, kind of is a natural uh predecessor i'm sorry a successor to until dawn yep. that um i did get in like like little hope for instance because we saw similar faces on different entities i got kind of confused about like what is my point of view about this character like oh yeah was that the character that i loved seven scenes ago or was that a character that i yeah i'm over you know mm -hmm. have to be careful and find a balance that's right pumpkin athena's arrow says that in detroit the three protagonists were so different that's true they had very very different circumstance very yeah. different uh kind of super objectives and so mm -hmm. on um this is fantastic input team okay so i'm seeing mostly the love is for that uh, single. single character to role play and then followed by an ensemble mm -hmm. of three or more characters so i guess what i can take from this is that once you break the concept of having more than one character uh -huh. give me three give me four give me five yeah right mm -hmm. as long as you still feel like you're getting a uh a full experience with each of them and that doesn't feel like it's too surface because I've seen the point of like if you have too many characters that you're controlling sometimes what you can fall into is that you, the story or the depth of the character suffers. Yeah, Julie L. Rose is saying that a single character because it feels like the character is theirs and the multiple characters in Detroit works because it feels like each of the characters have their own story for a majority of the game. Mm -hmm. And then they do all kind of come together in that third act. Mm -hmm. um, it, does, it does get into, when you're talking about a branching narrative, you know, the more characters you introduce, the more variables you're going to have and the more complicated it's going to be to have all of those interactions add up. Yeah. And feel like justifiably, con you know, the, like we were talking about, the before and after, the, the cause and effect consequences. Mm -hmm. Um. Something that I thought that Until Dawn did really well is because we are playing as multiple characters and um, our choices matter and have life or death consequences is the choices that we would make as one character would have a life or death effect on another character that like I'm also I also have an attachment to or yeah, yeah. a point of view on. So if as Mike, for example, I don't want to I choose like not to side with Emily, then Emily's story is impacted by the choices I made as Mike, which I think was really cool mm. um how you can feel the choices that you're making as each character have an impact on the other characters as well. Here's a question. Mm -hmm. um, I guess this is back to the kind of cause and effect thing. Remind me back to our, before we got into genre. Okay. So we were talking about uh, the, your favorite oh, the thing effect. was that your choices matter. The top one was because people die and there's life and death consequences. The second, uh, your second favorite thing was that there's the butterfly effect. So okay. you can, you have a visual cue on screen to let you know that some choice that you made is going to have a lasting impact. Okay, so I'm gonna, this is a little bit abstract, so go with me here. But when it comes to the uh, cause and effect aspect of this butterfly effect thing, mm -hmm. Is it your preference, dear player, that you're playing a game where choice A equals reaction or um, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call it cause A, right? Well, that's your choice. Cause or choice A equals reaction uh, A. Versus if you go uh, choice A, equals reaction 
or effect. Sorry, I got to type this out twice because I've just made it too muddy. Question mark. So what I'm getting at is cause, I'm gonna do this. Okay, just one second. Pardon the long-winded nature of my very existence. Okay, by this I mean, mm. if I make, if, if, if I can, I can think about it. I, I kind of like know the consequence of my action. Someone's running, right? Uh, Amelia's character is running towards me and she goes to leap and I choose to not catch her. I know that the effect is going to be that she's going to fall, right? Versus, oh no, I'm, I'm leaving the room. I have to choose one of these two things to take with me. I'm going to take the chapstick or I'm going to take the glass. And it turns out that if you take the glass, Amelia's character dies. And if I take the chapstick, Amelia's character lives. Do you prefer to know or do you not need to know? Does that make sense? I understand there could be both, but what I'm looking for is satisfying because if, if I know that this choice might have that effect, this cause might have that effect, okay. then I feel like I'm knowingly driving the story, where, which would be, I guess, two in this case. Or if my choice is having an unknown effect, okay. then I feel a little bit more like I'm a pawn to the machine of the game. And now I'm, I, I dug a hole here, but then six scenes later, someone trips in the hole and breaks their leg. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't really understand this. It's a little though. convoluted. Yeah. Anytime I do anything that has an equal sign or a variable, it freaks Amelia out. Well, I just don't. They look very similar to me, so I don't really understand what the difference is. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete this. Okay. And I'm gonna say, my cons, my choices have a dot 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 known effect or an unknown effect. I think you accident just missed known. No effect. There you go. Okay, this is a simpler way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, okay. My choices have an unknown effect, and that's cool, because like when I'm playing in, uh, when I played in The Witcher 3, mm -hmm. I didn't really know, because I didn't know enough about the lore, I didn't know enough about the world, I was just kind of individually making a decision of like, I don't trust this dude, I'm not going to do his side quest, I'm out of here. Yeah. And then, like... Hours later in the game, they were like, you didn't help that one dude, so now you have no armor yeah. or whatever. Versus if they're like, do this thing and then that'll happen. Mm -hmm. And I go, nah, I don't need that to happen. Okay, so you're like knowing ahead of time what you're opting into versus like you're given a choice and you don't know how that's going to come into effect later in the story. Yeah. Okay. All right. I understand. Yeah. Because what I'm trying to understand from a from a game design point of view, right? If we're building a game that you're going to be playing, and you are making decisions that have an unknown effect, I don't want you to feel ripped off if you were like, ah, oh, but I was trying to keep Amelia's character alive, but I forgot to lock that one door, and so now she got attacked by the monster. For uh, example, do you see what I'm getting at? Like, yeah. versus if you're like able to see enough in the future that what your actions would do, what the consequences would be, you know? Uh -huh. You could be like, no, I, I don't like that character. I'm locking her out of this room. Okay. Gcat says that the second situation where the known effect can be incredibly frustrating to them unless there is a really good clue beforehand. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it just feels like you already need to know the game before you can play it. Okay. And I see Magnolia Sims is saying got to have a mix of both for them. Um, they like some short-term consequences that are obvious but could have long-term consequences that have a payoff later. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe that's that's what it boils down to is immediate uh, consequences and more long-term consequences. Yeah. Jesse Dunn says consequences should be obvious after you've made the choice not before and Ooh, uh i like that way of putting it maffer blaze says it's more interesting if you have an unknown effect um okay so i'm gonna write this down uh okay. i like that the consequences should have an obvious effect after you've made the choice i like that consequences right so okay so then that means that you're if a choice is going to have a long-term effect a long a long-term unknown effect that after it happens, it has to be a justifiable 
consequence to your choice as opposed to a sort of more abstracted one. Uh, I, I don't know uh, how many of you who are here have also played Beyond Two Souls, but one of my uh, criticisms mm -hmm. of until of um, Beyond Two Souls was that I wasn't so sure which of my choices were impacting what because it's nonlinear. Yeah. You know, it's kind of abstract in that way. So Misty uh, Rain says uh, an example for them is when Sam is running from the Windigo. Uh, there's a few parts where you have the choice to run without closing the door or to close the door to prevent them from coming in as quickly. Okay, so it has some some sort of like natural logic to it. Mm -hmm. um, I saw Oni had a good point as well here that uh, in real life, you don't get an obvious consequence to your mm -hmm. action, which I think is also in the sort of very French way of uh, Beyond Two Souls that like, I could make a decision today and I have no idea how that's going to pay off mm. in the future. Also, uh, Blue Blue Member says that um, in House of Ashes, um, you have an air support choice in the beginning. Um, right. Where uh, it happens in the beginning to either call for air support or not. And that affects in the end right, if right, right. Salim is taken prisoner or not. So you can't know that in the beginning, but a choice that you made at the very beginning is going to have an effect on oh, the character okay. that so, you've gone to. Oh, okay. So, so then that, that that's really interesting. And and pardon us if we get in, into any spoiler territory for uh, the supermassive uh, dark picture anthology. But what I'm getting there is that from from this breakdown, it tells me that I should be able to anticipate a little bit what would happen if I did that. Mm -hmm. but the net result of what I did is greater than what I was originally able to anticipate. Because I did think about that in uh, House of Ashes mm -hmm. when they were like, you know, should we have air support? Mm -hmm. Here I am, like, I'm playing a scary game. There's going to be a, the odds that I'm going to need reinforcements, you know, like the here come the eagles type situation. So I anticipated that calling for air support or allowing for air support would get us some like help out, out at the uh, out of the end of the game mm -hmm. so that was satisfying but the unknown effect the unknown consequence of that is that is related of, to salim which yeah, i don't want to get into for spoiler reasons um but. yeah uh and then zement also has an interesting point saying that uh long-term unknown effects uh, need to be uh, they like when it's obvious after the fact like you realize oh I could have done this I thought uh, about making the situation yeah, yeah. better so you go back you realize that a choice that you made had this consequence and even if you didn't necessarily intend to that's what happened because of that specific choice that right you, you could walk it back logically yeah. to what Maybe, it was that you uh, did that did that which I think maybe is the thing with some of the telltale games if you feel like you're more on rails you know where it's or it's more of a um, you know, this ending or that ending type deal instead of like these endings or these permeations of it mm -hmm. is that you feel like when you get to the end, you understand that all of the things you did got you there. Because mm -hmm. okay. hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Like yeah. I can tell you things now that I did like right when I graduated out of college that have helped me to get to now, but right when I graduated out of college, I didn't have any idea that they would add up to what they did. Yeah, but and then also Neon and Mew both say that um, there has to be the logic behind it so that you're able to put together a choice that you made at the beginning of the game as having this consequence because otherwise it could be really confusing mm -hmm. and you have to be able to remember the choice that you made and how the effect is happening. So making right. a clear... Um, connection between right. the consequences. Clear. So you can tra chase it back. Um, yeah, Pink Pumpkin's mentioning the flowchart in Detroit Become Human being a perfect example of that. I think, um, I don't know that we would have a flowchart exactly. I know a lot of people loved the flowchart. We don't really know enough about our game to tell you uh, if it's going to have a flowchart or not yet, but I do think that that is a good way to literally map it out visually mm -hmm. so that people can understand it. And the totems are getting a lot of love right now. Um, yeah. I see... Um, a couple of people, in fact, mentioning about the totems because they give you some clues, uh, like a premonition, mm -hmm. a flash of vision. Totems give clues, premonition. Right. 
Um, we're coming up on the top of the hour, but I do want to say thank you to a few more people before we take our hydration break, and then we're going to come Already back. Already an hour? Uh, I know, time flies. Uh, time flies, but y'all are doing incredibly. Um, thank you all for your good input, and uh, Memento Mori, thank you for being here for four months, screaming 28 stab wounds into the void. <laughs> thank you. And Emmy Kesama, thank you very much for these cheers. Appreciate this. Um, that sounds like very cool. Thank you. Also, if anybody has a game recommendation, um, I see we get them sometimes, uh, in messages and resub stuff, but can I ask you to drop a recommendation on this form? Because that's where we keep it all logged and that'll help us, uh, organize it with everybody else's recommendations. And Anarchin, thank you so much for the raid. Hey, what's going on? Thank you, Raiders. Come on in. Come on in. Welcome. Come on in. We're talking about Until Dawn and what makes it so special. We're getting into the weeds. Yeah, specifically the butterfly effect. But mm -hmm. y'all like a good old unknown effect. Mm -hmm. And Ragnaros, thank you for being here for 29 months. Wood, wood. Appreciate you. One question before we go on our hydration break Word. about the butterfly effect. So that... A specific thing about that is that you have a visual cue on screen that pops up that shows you that some a choice that you made is going to have a lasting impact on your on the characters or on the story. Like someone gave a gift sub. <laughs> yeah. And then you know it something happened. Something happened. What do you think about that? Do you like having that uh, visualization, that visual cue that shows you that you've made a choice that's going to have an impact, or would you like? it to be a little less obvious. Yes, 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 love the visual. All right. We're gonna put up an official poll. So Here's an official know. poll. Uh, when it comes to a visual cue that your choice has an impact later on in the story, number one in the chat, cue me, tell me, let me know that I, I, I chose a left or a right branch or shh, keep it secret, keep it safe. Madison Ikea, welcome back for 38 months. Goblin Queen, thank you for that gifted sub to Evil Doer. You are entering yourself in 10 times for our microphone giveaway. And Neon Indus, thank you for being here for 25 months. We are grateful for your long-term support. And Zement, you are awesome. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us. I'm glad you enjoyed these uh, these game streams. We were really enjoying it too. Uh, Mo Brooks, welcome. Hey, Mo Brooks, welcome. Anybody hey. else here for the very first time? Uh, I see uh, Georgia MH is here for the first time too. Hey, Hello Georgia. and welcome. Uh, Thanks for hanging out with the Deckard Games Club. And Neon Indus, thank you for the gift sub. Wait, wait. <laughs> the gift subs yeah. on fire. Uh, Miles says that they like it more when you're seeing repercussions for your actions. So you know instantly when you made that choice, like, oop, that's something that's happening. And sweet Christabel, I think that's the I think that's the base of it. A visual cue encourages you to replay and look for the other choices. I think the reason why Cue Me Tell Me is winning this poll mm -hmm. is because you you want a branching narrative game to be replayable. And if I don't know what choices did what. I'm much less likely to replay it mm -hmm. because I could spend another 10 hours and get like a slightly different mm -hmm. thing, you know? Yeah. Um, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Y'all, you got some really good ideas. I am so grateful for all of your input. Really, truly from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for doing this with us because yes. it's uh, hugely insightful. So, so helpful. And in developing our own game, um, we know we're going to need a lot of good ideas coming at us. So thank you all for just being open and sharing whatever your thoughts are. Um, and especially to those of you who think the other thing, like if, yeah. the, if, a, a, if you, if you notice a lot of people are saying, oh, it's number one. And you're out there being like, nah, two. Stay deviant. I need the counterpoint yeah. to all of the points. Like a a yell says, um, if you make it, if you make something less obvious, then that's more like real life because in real life, one doesn't have time to prepare necessarily for big choices. It just happens. Right. right. Um, so I cool. think that's also a good point too. Well, when we come back, let's discuss a little bit more about the variety of characters, yeah, and their evolving relationships. And the, and the lore, maybe, as and well. And the lore. Mm -hmm. And the lore. All right, let's do that when we come back. We're going to take five minutes as we do each hour to give you all a chance to get some snacks, sort of move around, stretch, get a water, uh, whatever you got to do. Um, take your medicine. We super appreciate you all hanging out with us. And uh, we'll be back in five minutes. A reminder that tomorrow and Sunday is the grand finale of our Mass Effect 3 yes. playthrough. Uh, Amelia and I have been playing Mass Effect 1, 2, 3 in the Legendary Edition. We're having a lot of fun playing it. And quite candidly... It's going down. It's going down. This weekend. The entire planet and galaxy 
is in danger and we're gonna save it um also speaking of fridays because those of you who are here are all about the games club vibe when it comes to fridays uh next friday we're going to be uh probably completing the frozen wilds dlc before we play or before we do a games club the following week on horizon zero dawn and then we are going to start horizon forbidden west starting on the 20th um and we're gonna be moving right along into is it the 20th of sunday i think it might be a sunday and march 4th we're gonna do a games club of life is strange we'll talk about life is strange one, Before the Storm, Life is Strange 2, and Life is Strange True Colors. Yeah, it's a, sa- it's a Sunday. Yeah, so we'll play. Anyway, you get it. Uh, whole bunch of Horizon stuff coming your way. Yes. Horizon Forbidden West is going to be super fun. And um, our next games club will be about Life is Strange. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, 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 yep. All right, team, let's take five minutes. Uh, the mods are going to drop it into emote only mode uh, just for the hydration break so they can take a moment. And we will see you on the other side in five Hey, Amelia. Hey. How you been? Eating monkey bread. Do you guys want to see what Amelia made? Last night, Amelia made monkey bread, which is... Dangerous. Ap- apparently, um, it's like little balls of a cavity. It's delicious. It is little balls of dough that you dip in butter and uh, roll in cinnamon sugar. Mm. It's my first time ever making it mm. with my friend. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It is really good. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Let's rise up. Okay. Let's rise up. Gotta get the water. Mm. Rise up. Rise up. Rise up. Mm. Oh, so good. Mm. So dangerous. All right. So, team, we're talking oh, about. Oh, so much sugar. We're talking about Until Dawn and what makes it so special. Yeah, what makes it so special? And we polled you all to find out. And I'm going to update our topic because I think we're going to talk about learning the lore. lore. All right. So this one I'm not going to do as many polls for because I think this one's going to be a little bit longer form. A little more chatty. But when it comes to the lore of Until Dawn, Let's not get too specific into what the lore is because a lot of us have played the game, a lot of us know the game. Lore means the story, the bigger story, the mystery you're uncovering, the truth about what happened that the character doesn't know and that we as the player learn. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to be making a game with the same lore as Until Dawn, so we're not really going to be trying to emulate it. But when you discover the lore, when you learn the lore in a video game, how do you like to get it? Yeah, so if I remember correctly, the way that you learn about the history of the house, the history of the mountain, the history of the mine and what went down is through finding clues. Like you find- Shiny clues. Mm-hmm, shiny clues. Um, And those clues, the environmental storytelling I'm mm -hmm. seeing from Nastia. And you gotta know like which clue is a, a shiny clue, which clue is worth worth knowing about by exploring uh-huh. your environment environmental um, storytelling environmental get a lot of love storytelling with a taco or something um are there also uh like you can go back and like see scenes i don't remember yeah i think that when we uncovered certain facts we basically had it spelled out for us like in and i'm just going to keep including the dark picture anthology but like in house of ashes when we found a letter it would like replay kind of this old newsreel thing that showed us like da, 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 when the old timey thing happened it was like this the totems give you flashes like mm-hmm. forethought and uh, uh premonitions about what could happen or what did happen non-linear clues that you have to put together on yourself yourself i think that's really clue it's really clue i think that's really clever i think it's really clever i'm seeing uh the the reward for in you're you're exploring your environment the reward is learning about the lore and learning more um i see my friend pi is saying uh, pilfering is saying i think you need a good mix of overall lore but you can discover uh, in the settings in journals in documents in letters um and cryo ghostu is mentioning showing and not telling 
Mm. Classic show, don't tell. See, when when we're doing a, a film, a lot of times it's better if you can show something instead of tell it because otherwise it feels like, hello, I'm a character in the story and I'm about to give you a bunch of information. And I enjoy Mass Effect. I'm having a good time playing Mass Effect. But I do feel like the lore in Mass Effect comes at me in a way that I, with my short attention span, can't really deal with because they're just like, hello, I'm going to read you the dictionary definition of this world and the previous conflict. Yeah, exposition, exposition dumps. dumps. Mm-hmm. Where they're just like, Brrr. and my tiny brain can't handle all that information just kind of coming at me like that. I like to get it in bits and pieces and, and kind of piece it together a little bit more. Um, but that's I, my own temperament. I also see someone, uh, someone said that seemingly uh, unimportant facts become important later on. Okay. Okay. So unimportant facts being important later on leads me to a question that is also a life is strange question versus I feel like in until dawn or definitely in resident evil, which is what we did games club on last, last time in resident evil. If you pick up a clue, breadcrumbs, yeah. you can do something with it, right? Like you have a key and then that key is going to open a door. However, in life is strange, for instance, mm-hmm. we have like, this chapstick might be really important, but uh, um, it's it's mixed about a bunch of clues where it's the remote and the lens cap. So in Until Dawn, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, if we find a shiny clue, it's, it's important. directly important, yeah. right? Whereas in Until Dawn, it's like, oh, my mother, no, 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 my, no, no, or I'm sorry, strange. in Life is Strange, it's like, my mother used a remote and I remember my mother's scent. You know, and you're like, I don't, I mean, you're learning about the character, but you're not necessarily, it's not necessarily tied to the narrative. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Utility of objects versus narrative value. That's okay. a great way to describe it, Miles. Um, if the character, a dragon says, if the characters tell you lore, it's uh, cool if you get pieces from different perspectives, sometimes mm. conflicting info, mm. and so you have to find the mm. truth. Mm. Dragon cat, dragon cat. It's not just the sugar that's making me do this. That was a good idea. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna write that down. If yeah, I, I to me that's something that's really fascinating because. I don't believe that there, I, th- I think there is a universal truth. I think there is uh, an event that definitely happens, but I think that there's always a different point of view about the event that happened, and all of those different point of views make up a greater truth. The unreliable narrators. Mm. Yeah, there you go. Uh, NPCs that can lie. Mm. Yeah. Because, I mean, sometimes, like, I get so used to like following the waypoint or looking at the thing where I'm like, okay, now I run here, now I run here, now I run here. That I do think it's kind of cool when a game is like, oh, you definitely need to go that way. And then if you go that way, you die. Mm-hmm. Because that character wanted you to die. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? As, oppo- as opposed to something that's like, the game is telling you like, now do this. Now yeah. do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Until dawn. Um, oh, they briefly mentioned Josh, Hannah, and Beth's dad made movies. Mm-hmm, which which be- is a seemingly small fact that became much important later on when the first plot twist is revealed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Broccoli Bingus, thank you so much for the four gift sub group hugs. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm thank going to you. summon a butterfly effect. Ah. Oh, what nice. do you that? That's an actual butterfly. It's, it's a real butterfly. All right. That so exploded. let's next talk about... Um, Let's talk about the variety of characters because okay. something that I think Until Dawn does really well is having very different characters that you get to play as. Um, True poem, I want to know everybody's favorite characters. Yeah. Can you all shout out your favorite characters and I'll make a little list here? Like, give me your top eight characters in this game. And Seeing morally ambiguous characters. Gotta have I... that Sam. Black Cat plays, gotta have that Sam. Sam, 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 Sam. Emily! Uh, I see some people decidedly not Emily. Josh. Uh, Josh. Yep, yep, yep. The therapist. Mike. Okay, yeah, Mike. Chris. What about my boy Matt? Not seeing him. Isn't there a Matt? <laughs> there was a Matt too, right? I'm not mistaken. Mike. There is a Matt. Okay, good. Okay. Fine. It's like Matt and Mike. I'm not going to name yeah. two characters so closely. So named. I definitely think that, that it's a little tricky with, that the, happens, with the names. Right? Um, Chris, right? Chris, Chris, Chris. We got Josh on there. Mm-hmm. Um, who Ashley. else? 
Ashley. That's right, Ashley with the beanie, right? Mm hmm. All right, I think that's good. Okay, let's pull them up. All right, so what are your favorite characters in this game? Is it Sam? Is it Emily? Is it Josh? Is it the therapist? Is it Mike? Is it Matt? Is it Chris? Or is it Ashley? What's it gonna be? Who are your favorites? I mean, Sam is. Final girl. Final Girl and also Sam came I overwhelmingly mentioned first, like just yeah. if you look at how people mm -hmm. typed it into the chat. Um, yeah. you know, uh is is Emily most memorable because we don't like her? I don't know. She definitely is the most antagonistic, I think, out of all the characters. Everyone but Jess. Jess didn't make it on the board, huh? Sorry, Jess. We we just get honestly, uh who's Jess? Does anyone know who Jess is? Jessica, 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 that's why. Jessica? She is the one with the with the braids, the blonde. Until Dawn, Jessica. Hold Mike's on. girlfriend. Let me see a, a picture of. That one. Looks similar to Sam. Oh, the non-Sam. Yeah. The non-Sam. Mm-hmm. Fine. Okay. Sorry, Jess, you didn't even make the cut. But this is a pretty even split. Yeah, except for Sam. So... Let's talk about Sam. Okay, so Sam is obviously number one. Obviously number one. And Mike. And then it's Josh. Josh. Followed a little bit like Emily, but then it kind of peters out. Emily's, and Emily and the therapist are kind of tied. Okay. So what makes Sam so special? Why is she your favorite character? Do we like Sam because of her character or because of her actress, asks Kai. Interesting. Sam's towel is the best character. Um, mm. Okay, you, Sam is easy to like because maybe she's the only decent person in the beginning. Interesting. Sam I gotta is. say, of all these characters, when I first met them in our first blind playthrough, I just didn't like them. I was like, I don't really like the people. I think that they're all like really mean-spirited. Except and, for Sam. Except she's for Sam. Mm -hmm. Except for Seth. Chris has got some innocent vibes too, but he goes, I mean, they're all kind of guilt, guilty by association. Okay, so I also see that she's more consistent. She's sensible. Um, Hannah and Beth. Um, sensible. So I feel like she, she's, uh, she's smart. Hmm. Um, she also kind of calls people out. That's why... I liked her is because she she, she was speaks not... from the player's POV a little bit because yeah. I think the thing that we all associate maybe ourselves with Sam's POV a little bit more because when they're being shitty she's the one to be like stop you're being shitty. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so she really doesn't even like her at all. I mean that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. uh, the the cool thing about having so many characters is that some are going to appeal to some people and mm -hmm. you, know, you feel like Sam Sam is the MC. Yeah, she's a little bit of the center point of it. Mm -hmm. um, she's consistently nice to the game um, and also not a complete damsel in distress. That's a valid point. Mm -hmm. Hey, Alice, that girl, thank you for being here for 14 months. And Jaden, thank you for 16 months of much, much love. Grateful for you. Chris o Games, thank you for the cheers. Thank you, thank you. And Neon, thank you again for the gift sub. To Shin. Sweet. Mm -hmm. The mean characters are entertaining to watch and role play, says Tinker. So... There's something about playing a character that's an unsavory character that's enjoyable because you get to, I mean, y'all are pretty nice people. As far as Amelia and I can tell over the last four years, there's a bunch of really friendly and kind people involved in this uh, streaming community, but maybe it's, maybe there is some fun in getting to be the jerk, you know, in, yeah. in getting to like have that permission. Is there, um, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point in, uh, is do you necess do you find yourself sometimes attracted to the meaner characters in games or or taking a more bold uh, m maybe not as polite uh, point of view because it's the opposite of very different than how you are in real life? I'm or a do bullet. You yeah. Do you want to play as a character who is like you or a character who is not like you? Just curious. I mean, it, of course, it depends on the game and it could change every time. But what generally speaking. Do you want to jump into a character that associates, you know, kind of sees the world similarly to how you do, which is maybe more of why Sam sticks out? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to play a character that's not like you? And of course, like you is a big concept as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that there is something really cool about video games that is not like any other 
uh, you know, medium where you get to really inhabit the characters that's similar to what it's like for us as actors. Because honestly, as an actor, I want to play things that are not me. Like, I don't really like to play me. And the truth is, like, a lot of times they're like, okay, uh, well, we're going to have this character and he looks exactly like this guy and he's had all the same life experiences as this guy da, 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 da. you know what i mean and then it's like i'm not acting i'm just being that guy whereas for me i would you know i don't know to me that's why like super villainous characters mm. are exciting or like yeah. you know somebody who has like a completely different world view than me uh pumpkin says that they like to play video games to escape from themselves you know so it's a it's a different it, it just getting to step into somebody else's shoes Mm -hmm. well it seems that both are very cool options uh both are equally viable Mm -hmm. uh in this thing slightly more in favor of characters that you relate to or that they're like you but there's so many of you that say you want to play a character that's not like you yeah well because mew gives a good point that games give you a safe environment to try out doing something different than what you would do like trying to make a more a villainous choice or do something more dangerous or more daring and uh that no one is purely good and perfect by nature and it's good to be curious about it that's a good way of putting it mm-hmm, it depends mm-hmm. on the character for sure yeah uh and uh but i see vesh is saying they don't like to play mean characters because it makes them feel uncomfortable mm. which is valid yeah. for sure um saturns thank you for being here with your prime hey, appreciate you subscribing you doing? thank you for supporting our channel and hello trisha here <laughs> welcome back for 14 months okay magnolia sims i'm gonna jump on that because you're talking about mass effect and the renegade and paragon thing um amelia and i are uh you know we're gonna do our finale of it uh tomorrow and sunday but we're definitely playing a paragon playthrough only very rarely are we making the renegade choices and it's mostly the renegade interrupts which for those of you who haven't played is like instead of a, a dialogue choice it's like a way that you can intercept the cutscene. and i have to say that after three games of playing renegade we've been making more and or i'm sorry three games of playing paragon and sort of like by the book you know being the good specter um we are more and more choosing the renegade option i don't know if it's because we're getting more comfortable as commander shepherd or if it's because i'm getting more fed up with the people that are just repeating themselves that i don't believe i'm like elusive man fuck off you know like but to me the i i, I, I feel if a care if, if the if the difference is like good or bad mm. nice and friendly and you know kind of all these like societally acceptable traits I end up doing those even if I have permission to be the anti-hero or the renegade or the deviant. But, you know what I mean? And like, that's something that I think that Until Dawn does a really good job with is that even the characters that seem in the beginning to be like the bad one or the the villain or the good one, that there is definitely space t- to... Um, relate to them that they're not just bad and they're not just good like for example emily who seems to be the one who is the most antagonistic out of all of the characters if you depending on the choices that you make if you continuously align with her and then you you finally get to take the controls of like now you are emily changes your point of view about her a little bit more because you're able to see maybe why she is that mm-hmm. way and what is spurring her to be more competitive because she feels like she has to put on this front. Um, so I think that's cool. Same with Josh, you know, he's a character that like in the beginning, maybe you feel one way about him, but then you see like his experiences and then you see a different point of view. Of that's him. true. I mean, my point of view about Josh changes radically. In yeah, this and numerous times too. And I think that that's something really special that Until Dawn does is that no character is completely good or completely bad. They all have, um, they all make bad choices and then they also all make good choices depending on you. All right. I see a lot of discussion about it in the chat. I'm going to throw this up there for a quick poll. Give me characters that are one good and evil. I want to know. I want good and evil. I want Sauron and I want Gandalf, right? Or morally gray. Give me something in between where I got to interpret it. I also knew, maybe it's because I had seen it before, but like after rewatching Lord of the Rings and the very beginning, when you meet Sauron, you're like, oh no, it's Sauron. Sauron. You're like, Ooh, something's bad with that wizard, you know? Like, 
Something's, Something's gone bad a with that wizard. You should throw that wizard <laughs> out. Something's gone a little rotten with him Something's, from the beginning. Uh, you know, corrupted. Yeah, a little corrupted wizard. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, okay, I see a lot of y'all in the in the morally gray category. And that is also what y'all liked so much about Hank as a character in Detroit Become Human is that he was morally gray. He wasn't completely good, and he wasn't completely bad. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. I do think that there is a lot of power though in having a character that is good and a character that is evil to give you like some some bookends Mm -hmm. you know because if you're gonna have a morally gray character you have to have something that's good and something that's evil so so that you can have a spectrum in between because you know if it's if it's only good and i think what you're that that poll tells me is that you're not looking for only good and only evil you know sides yeah or maybe what it is is that there is a character there are characters that are seemingly very obviously good and very obviously bad from the beginning but then you have a moment where maybe they're being tempted yeah like with frodo you know he seems really good, but then there is the moment when he really wants that ring, and you're like, but no! And, and then he's like, but yes! And, you know, so the characters that you have put into one category can shift out of that. Yeah. I think that's an important... Yeah, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, um, I see a couple of you are mentioning Joel in The Last of Us um, about, you know, total, like, willing to kill, crush people straight up, surviving. Joel. But when it comes to Ellie, very different side of them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that can be a thing is where you put one character who is very much one way under these circumstances and then very much that way under the other circumstances. To me, that's to me, that's kind of like where you get the most like legitimate morally gray characters Ooh. where you see their light side and you see their dark side. Yeah. Not that they're kind of in the middle. They're not like going around being like, oh, I could take it a little evil or I could do like a little bit good. But instead they're like good under these circumstances and evil under yeah, those circumstances. Yeah, Vincent says, give us a good and evil character that is in a morally gray situation. There you go. There you go. We talked about Resident Evil on the last one, but we had this question at the end where we we're talking about the villains that are coming after us with uh, like Heisenberg. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden Heisenberg starts making sense. Yeah. and appealing to you and you're like oh no <laughs> yeah. Why? i thought it was like i thought these were all going to be enemies and now maybe maybe i could yeah i don't know, I don't know. all right this let's... is really good intel team i'm gonna keep it moving because i know uh in the next 30 minutes we got a lot of things that we want to cover uh, we are going to continue to stream a little longer today but we're going to uh round out our until dawn in about 30 minutes so game mechanics I want to talk to you about the game mechanics because there's quite a few in this uh, in this game. There are the quick time events. Mm-hmm. There are the uh, dialogue choices. There are um, the uh, don't move, don't breathe. Right, 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 right. Don't stop. <laughs> Don't stop. Yeah. Believe. What are what are some other ones? There's the quick time choices. There is the don't move, don't breathe. There are the dialogue choices. Um. Um. We have timed decisions. Yeah. Because you're gonna either. I mean, it's a little bit of a QTE, but it's more of a decision and less of a reaction. Mm-hmm. Um. The yeah, the heartbeat thing. The heartbeat monitor is mm-hmm. is. Uh, yeah. You gotta. You gotta. So those are technically. The heartbeat monitor, is that, does that come up in Until Dawn or is that in Dark Picture Anthology? Do they have, do they have the heartbeat monitor in mm-hmm. Until Dawn or is that the, just the don't, don't move? move? I think it's just the don't move. Thing, that's the Dark Picture thing. Yeah. But we um, can talk about, we can include the heartbeat. Also, don't, uh, inspecting objects, like turning the objects in order to, to see something else. Oh, yeah. So interactable, uh, interactable items. Yeah, the don't move was really stressful. Um, and I'm going to call, I think the totems are mm-hmm. a huge, I mean, that's a clue thing, but. Um, um, Miles says that an important message about quick times is that uh, accessibility. So, you know, yep, being able, yep. not necessarily having to do it, 
Um, if yeah, you don't or, want to. or giving uh, having mobility options in the game so mm-hmm. that, for instance, if somebody is using like a customizable controller, oh. there's some really cool. There's what is al- it? also the point and shoot. Like there are oh, definitely yeah, moments yeah, when yeah, you yeah, have yeah, to like yeah. shoot the Windigo or shoot or not shoot the squirrel. And right. I'm like, don't shoot the squirrel. The squirrel's just eating. You know? Right, 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 right. Uh, yeah. um, okay, there's eight. Let's pull them. Which is your favorite game mechanic in Until Dawn? Number one, the quick time events, which is uh, some logs are rolling and you have to jump over them by pressing square. If you have a dialogue choice where you are choosing, I'm going to respond aggressively or more passively. Or not at all. Or not at all. Number three, the don't move, don't breathe, hold the controller perfectly still. Number four, the timed decisions, where uh, it's like a quick time event, but it's more of a choice that you're deciding to make as opposed to measuring your response time. Number five, the heartbeat, which is from the Dark Pictures Anthology, but we're gonna include it here because it's relevant. Number six, uh, interacting with the clues for more info, like I found this phone, but I flipped it over or I turned it on or I read the page. That was something they did very successfully in the Dark Pictures one, I thought. Uh Um, Because when I put a book down and then I got swept away by the story, I was like, damn, Mm -hmm. I should have read that. I totally should have read that. Um, Number seven, the clues or the totems that you're finding. And number eight is the sort of simplified uh, aiming and shooting uh, where you have this point that you're aiming at and then like a quick time event, you can line up your sight to shoot it. Mm. Um, Waffle. Thank you, Waffle. Thanks, Waffle. Uh, Appreciate your kind gift. Thank you for supporting our community like that. All of your uh, donations on the channel go to improving our streaming setup and uh, to our prize giveaways uh, and our mailings and stuff. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. And Mr. The Potato Jr., thank you for the gift sub to Ned's Declassified. Yo, Ned's. Welcome aboard, and thank you, Mr. Potato. Okay. It's coming in hot. It is coming in hot, hot, hot. Dialogue Choices is going to win this one. Mm -hmm. Dialogue Choices, and then, believe it or not, it's the Don't Move, Don't Breathe. And no fair setting it down on the table, team. (laughs) (laughs) I know some of y'all did that, because I was tempted to do it, too. Yes, and then followed by, it seems... Interacting with the clues for more options, Mm -hmm. more info. So like clues inside the clues. Clues within clues, clues within clues. Uh, we, we heard you like clues, so we put clues in the clues, so you can clue while you clue. And then more clues with the totems and stuff. Yep, and clues with totems is up next. And, um, uh, and then the time, time decisions. decisions. Time decisions. Um, and quick time events is uh, actually pretty low. Yeah. See, I really like the quick time events. I think they're a lot of fun as a streamer because it gives me an opportunity to fail in a way that I wouldn't want to. So it changes the story, but I just got to deal with it because it's not always the case in a movie. Like, you know, spoiler alert, but Frodo gets stabbed a number of times and I don't want that to happen, but it makes the story better because it happened. Yeah. You know, I didn't want uh, in House of Ashes for our, our, our who's the, the leader of the, I don't know what her uh, name is, but in any case, she, you know, I don't want bad things to happen to my character, Characters. but if they do, it puts me in a worse situation so that there's more at stake. QTEs are hard to implement. Non-intrusively, mm-hmm. okay? You feel like it might break your uh, effect, uh, your kind of sense of the world, because all uh-huh. of a sudden there's a square up on there. Yeah. Uh, the don't move thing can be too sensitive for some people. Mm-hmm. Rachel, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like there was one part where I was like really bummed that Rachel fell down this crevasse and it was my fault because I didn't make the right choice fast enough. I screwed up the QTE, but then it put me in a different kind of a predicament. Ah, so, uh, fam says some players don't like QTEs because they take direct control away from the players. Hmm. Like, and then rock. Tell you what you don't have in life team. Mm. Direct control. (laughs) Rocker girl says QTEs can be fun, but it also interrupts the story some. Okay. Kai says that QTEs were great in Until Dawn, but not as great in uh, Dark Pictures, in their opinion. Yeah, Okay, Sauce makes a good point that they're genre-specific, so like the don't move thing is specific to certain kinds of stories. Okay, so I have a question then, because I'm seeing a few of you say that QTEs can take you out if it's not implemented correctly. What is an example of a well-implemented... QTE, a uh, quick time event. Like, how can you make a quick time event feel like it's not taking you out of the story? Good call. Or is it just always going to hey, take no, you out? No, okay, so number five, five has this. It's a little bit like rolling the dice in D&D. Mm. Because in D&D, you have choice over what your character does okay. most of the time. 
But if they succeed or fail is up to the die. And you have higher probability or higher choices. The Connor chase runs, you like that? <laughs> so you're still actively moving the character. Yeah. But then you have to choose if we're going to go this route or if we're going to go okay, that route. Okay, so I'm definitely seeing like action sequences or running or fighting. So it is moving the story along. Okay. 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 Uh, so what if, it, what if there was a booby trap? Mm-hmm. What if there's a booby trap? So you're not you're not running, but you have you know a, a short amount of time to notice, and if you don't push the button, then wah! <laughs> you know, is that acceptable? <laughs> okay, so you don't like them if they're in a cutscene, but if it is furthering the story along, if you're in some kind of combat. And then you got to make a move or you're trying or like the floor is falling out from beneath you and you got to make a move. But if it just uh, feels like it's out of nowhere, then that's when it takes you out. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. This is really fascinating to me because honestly, the quick time event thing is very prevalent in branching narrative games. The game we're making is definitely going to have a branching narrative. So the, uh, I guess the, the question is if I think what you're what I'm getting from that is that in the Connor chase scene you're already in the middle of driving the dude mm -hmm. and now we need to do things but instead of like a multi key you know multi button press maneuver to do something you know mm -hmm. like in in the Mass Effect we got like take cover and then like throw the grenade and then grenade and then command somebody else to do something that's a little complicated for some gamers and not as accessible but if you're just in a cut scene and then all of a sudden something comes along mm. and it like interrupts your cut. It's like what mode is your brain in? Briette says that the first QTE should not have, have lethal consequences because then... Right, like all of a sudden, duck! And then yeah. you die. Uh, and you no. wasted all of your time. Mm -hmm. How long would you say is until dawn in the average playthrough team? Is it? It's about 10 hours. It's a little shorter than Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit, but it's longer than the... Eight. It's longer than the Dark Pictures. Okay, was. here's another question. Uh, uh, Is here, it? Yeah, I think let's... Okay, so we... we, we I'm going to pause this. Mm -hmm. We'll put this away. Uh, so question for all of you about length of time for a bending narrative, branching narrative game. If you're going to sit down and play a branching narrative game, what is your favorite game length like when does it go too long or when is it too short like what's the ideal time that you want to be immersed into in this story in one playthrough in one playthrough mm -hmm. um shout it out shout it out what you Same got 10 hours okay eight hours 10 to 20 hours okay hold on i'm gonna do these i'm gonna try to do these in order um i'm gonna say okay do this do Um, 10 hours, uh, I'm going to say uh, 12 to 15 hours. Forgive me for doing kind of strange phrases, but uh, more than 20 hours? Mm-hmm. Cool. Let's do it like that. What is your favorite length for a branching narrative game that you're going to embark on? How much time do you want to spend on your first playthrough? Is it going to be three hours? Is it going to be about five to eight hours? Is it going to be 10 hours? Is it going to be 12 to 15 hours or more than 20? What's your, what's your favorite length? I can tell you that after 20 hours of a game, I start to get itchy about it. It depends on the game. It depends on the game, but it, but if it's specifically like, if there's no like a uh, collectible element or like upgrade skill trees, you know, if I'm not playing like a bigger open world game, past 20 hours i just start to feel like it's too big for me anyway i'm just you know answering yeah. the question um 12 to 15 hours is clearly winning this poll okay so so then that means you all are saying that you feel like until dawn for your ideal length is a little bit shorter sure. is that the case is that the case zero percent of you want a game that's three hours long zero percent of you very interesting. Um, do you think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this poll go because sometimes I mm -hmm. answer 
my own question too quickly. Um, Tate Baggins, thank you for being here with your Prime. Galahad, Galahad, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a knight. Mm -hmm. uh, Lauren, thank you for being here for 11 months. Appreciate you. Uh, Kai is back for four months. Oh, uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Appreciate you. And Mad Loves Horror is back for eight months. And Kyra Lee is back for 30 months in a row. All right, there's a lot of good intel coming at us. I'm going to pause yeah. this. Anybody else who wants to uh, pitch in on this? One, two, three, four, or five in the chat. Um, what's up? How you doing, Hagzoid? Thank you for chatting with us for the first time. Welcome to our channel. Hey. Thanks for coming in here. So... Okay, all right. So it seems that the ideal time is about 12 to 15 hours and then followed by 10 hours. I mean, we could, go so far, we, sh we could go so far as to say the ideal length for a branching narrative game is between 10 and 15 hours, mm -hmm. according to this. Point. Yeah, yeah. No one voted for three hours because I guess that's just too short for you to get too invested. Mm -hmm. And um, you probably just couldn't make very many choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting, interesting. And, yeah, this is one playthrough. Okay, asking about. so if it's if it's ten to fifteen hours, um, if a game is ten to fifteen hours long, um, how many times do you think you'll replay it? Once, twice, and this is for a thrice, bending narrative, so you know, four, like you could have times. multiple multiple playthroughs if you made a different choice. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, it's going to depend on the game and all the other things. I mean, all of these questions are very subjective. This would be for a branching narrative game. Mm -hmm. So if you were playing a game that was, let's say, between the length of Until Dawn and Detroit Become Human, somewhere between 10 and 15 hours long, how many times do you think you would want to replay it to feel satisfied so that you're not feeling like, eh, did it once, I don't really need to do it again, or I don't want to have to play it 50 times to know everything? This is depending and... on how many choices, how many endings there are. Okay, that's a good point. Very yeah. good point. Um, also, thank you guys so yeah, this much. This is so helpful. For, you have no uh, idea. You are for, literally building a video game right now. <laughs> yeah, for for your input because this is hugely, hugely helpful. Because when Brian and I are having our our game development meetings, uh, we have so many questions, and so this really helps to answer them because we're making this game for you. We want you to love it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm about it. I, okay, so it starts to fade out after three times, and then it goes all the way to all the times. Okay. Where someone is like, I want to play everybody. It's fun to discuss it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, just the phase. I mean, to, to me also, uh, it's been really interesting. Shout out to anybody who's watching this video later. Uh, feel free to comment. Yeah. Uh, let us know in the comments what you think, um, because it's really fascinating. And it's a great way for you all to share things with us in a more... Uh, direct way because a lot of times while we're playing the game we can't unpack it like this okay so all the times twice thrice all the times okay but look at this uh four times is more likely than just once mm -hmm. so if y'all are playing a branching narrative you want to play it at least twice, twice. Mm -hmm. so it's got to be playable at least two or three times and then about as many of you again would prefer to play every possible path, path. All right. Good intel. Good intel. So I also saw some people talking about like depending you want to get the good ending or you want to get the bad ending. What if there is not necessarily a good or bad ending? It's a just... morally gray one because you ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like different. If you've made these choices, then you're going to get this experience or if you made these choices then you're going to get this kind of experience it's not necessarily good or bad it's just different because you've had a different experience of it do you like that or would you rather have like this is the good ending and then this is the bad ending <laughs> do you like morally gray or um where it's not necessarily black and white or do you want to know like no this is the good ending where everything's winning and this is the bad ending where everything's losing you like when each has good and bad sides. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's life, isn't it, right? As long as there's an ending where everyone's happy. <laughs> that's sweet. Um, multiple outcomes is better than just one. Having a variety of endings is one. Um, just different endings. Doesn't matter if it's good or if it's bad. Multiple outcomes. Mm, a shocking ending. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to do a poll like this. I included one ending just so it didn't get confusing in explaining it. 
How many endings in the best branching narrative? One ending? Great question. Two endings? Three endings? Four endings? Five or more up to 10 endings? Number six in the chat, if you want more than 10 endings. And number seven in the chat, if you want as many as possible, like a ton, dude. <laughs> we just have like so many permeations. I have no idea how many endings there really are in Detroit Become Human. I know there's lots of permeations. I know that the mm. epilogues help make uh, even more possible endings. Riss33 says different endings makes the game feel more personal. I think that Riss, is a really good point. I think you're right on because then my playthrough feels very different than Amelia's playthrough. Very different than your mm -hmm. playthrough. Interesting. Interesting. I see uh, Rocker Girl saying five, but the minimum is three. I think everybody's kind of agreeing that if you if you show up with two endings in your branching narrative, that's not a branching get narrative. Get out of yeah. here! <laughs> that's not enough endings. Detroit has over forty, according to Google. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Uh, I believe that. But I do also know that you're creating different endings by having different permeations because you have three different characters. Right? So if you have 40 different endings and three playable characters, and they're each of those playable characters are having about 10 different possible endings. So that the combination of those 10 possible endings is giving you 40 or more possible endings. Does so that make sense? Yeah. So it seems that... As many uh, as possible, dude. Uh, five endings. Five, five, uh, five. It seems like five to 10 endings would be uh, acceptable. And those of you who are out there for more than 10 endings just want as many optimums. Uh, optimums. Mm -hmm. You heard me. <laughs> or uh, but a minimum of three. Okay. Okay. That is really good intel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't worry. Whatever video game we do end up making will not have one or two endings. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> mm. You like the 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 wonderful. Yeah. Look at this. You like the variety. Uh huh. You like the variety. <laughs> Could be up to eighty five different endings in Detroit Become Human. That's incredible. Uh. Yeah. It's well. I guess the question is, is it a unique ending or is it a permeation of an ending? Right. So, uh, in Until Dawn, I don't think, I don't remember there being a uh, flow chart at the end to show you, like, what could have, what potentially could have happened that you didn't do, um, like in Detroit where you have the flow chart, um, or in the end of uh, Life is Strange when it showed, like, these players, half of the players went made with this choice while other half of the players made this choice and this one did this and they romanced this person. So you're seeing the different options in the end, what you could do, which gives you the, um, I guess, could encourage you to want to play more. Um, I feel like until dawn, I don't think they did that. You can investigate your butterflies, which we didn't really do. We didn't investigate the butterflies. We need to investigate the butterflies, but I can actually summon some butterflies by pushing this button. Butterfly! Thanks, did, you, did you know if you go outside your house right now and you yell, butterfly, that's going to happen? <laughs> okay, I want to know, do you want to know what choices other people made at the end of the game? Is it fun for you to know, like, you know, like 80% of the people here? I mean, I, I guess if you're here and you're polling, you might be into percentages like me. But, um, you know, to me, that was really fascinating about, like, the Life is Strange games, too, which we're going to do the game is, Games Club on coming up. Um, uh, but a handful of you are just like, you don't care. You're like, this is my path. This is my playthrough. Mm -hmm. This is what I got. Do you have to use that voice? Yes. If you want to, if you want to get the butterflies, butterflies to come. Butterflies! <laughs> it's fun to see different people's outcomes. Um, some people say, no, they don't need it. It's just, it's more about for them. And I mean, I guess you'd have to be connected online anyway for it to give you that. But um, the Wolf Among Us has that too. And it's fun to see. Um, and it's a good way to encourage, uh, what is, uh, uh, F, uh, FTLC, um, a good way to encourage multiple playthroughs if the epilogue hints at the other outcomes. Mm. So Very good. So that you know, like, player, you're here, and the whole world was destroyed, but it could have been different. Replay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Continue? Uh, Put in 50 cents to play again. Show other players choice so that's getting a lot of love uh, flow chart okay that's yeah getting a lot of so basically i what i what i get from that is that seeing uh visually what what other possibilities could lie for you uh, in the future for you are exciting as opposed to um just what could 
happen. Right, right. And um, I mean, like uh, at the end of Life is Strange two, for instance, if a character ends up imprisoned, then you would just you would just know that it would be possible for them to not be imprisoned. So you would just kind of it could be more subtle. I see your point. Uh, that it would just be um, inferred, you know, if someone ends up winning the game, then they could also end up losing the game or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Um, this is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, in the last, like, six minutes of our discussion of Until Dawn or so, because time has flown, uh, and then we're going to ramble on and check out a new, uh, a new game, um, we are curious if there's anything else about Until Dawn that we didn't touch on. Final thoughts. The final thoughts. What are some things if, that we did not necessarily touch on that you think are very important um, in uh, Until Dawn being so special and being so unique as yeah. a game? Yeah, and if you mentioned something earlier and it didn't come up again in the conversation yeah, is... and you want to make sure that we get it in here. Also, you should know that Amelia and I go back and we've been watching through these past games clubs and reading through the chat much slower, um, which has been a very, very helpful thing. So if you've shared something into the chat and we haven't necessarily uh, mentioned it on the stream, we are definitely reading all of this chat like a book after. Maintaining tension. Um, Seeing uh, love for foreshadowing. Uh-huh. It, uh, the ambient, the relationships. Mmm. It's allowance for the audience to participate and sub, and or subvert tropes of the horror genre. So you can go with what is likely to happen or you have the chance to take it away from. Mm. Um, the ability to play in co-op is getting a lot of fun. Uh, the couch co-op mode is really cool and probably one of my favorite things about streaming the Dark Pictures games. Mm -hmm. Uh, appreciate you so much. Um... Alina, thank you for subscribing with your prime. Oh, the recaps. Yes. How it had uh, like act breaks essentially and it would yes. recap. Yes, 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 yes. Where the therapist is saying like, oh, so far someone's died mm -hmm. and they are dead now because of the choices Ooh. which you have made. <laughs> uh-huh. You um, like that when that happens? <laughs> Yes. Um, the music. The music's getting some love too. We didn't. We if, didn't talk about music, but it definitely has a good. If you have effect. multiple characters, making sure that they're all, all equally important, so none feel like they're just kind of left. The filler character, uh -huh. right? So that could be about when we talked about how many playable characters that you can spread it too thin. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I get a little bit confused in the huge games with huge oh, lore. The questions uh, when the therapist asks you questions. Ah. Being. Yes. What do you, which of these things do you find more horrifying? Do you like to see a picture of a clown? Or do you like to see a picture of a scarecrow dressed as a clown? Do you like... I'm sorry. I'm genuinely sorry that I enjoy doing that. I think it's something I just can't resist. No clowns. Write down no clowns. Write down no I, clowns, please. I will please. not write that down. No, no. <laughs> Team, I think I am a bit of a clown, but I'm not like a, like a, I hope I'm not a scary clown. But as a clown, it's the sugar from the monkey bread. <laughs> Bloody Shion, thank you for the cheers. Happy Friday to you too. <laughs> uh, uh, diverse characters. Diverse characters is very important. Amelia and I agree. Yeah, so. I um, agree, for sure. D mm -hmm. Diverse worldview, diverse sexuality, diverse point of view of uh, the, what's happening in the story. Yeah. Diverse backgrounds. Very important. Very important. Um, exactly. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Team, this has been really fascinating. Um, we I want to do a recap. Okay, Amelia's gonna do a recap. Can we sit for the recap? Because I've been I've been yeah. rambling around. Actually, we'll 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 sit after the break. All right, all right, all right. Recap it. Recap. Hold on, so, I got a button for that. Really? Kinda. Oh my god. Yay. All right. So. Until Dawn, your fate, when we asked you what was the most awesome thing about it, your first thing was that your choices mattered, followed by the lore of the story, then the variety of characters, followed by the game mechanics. Mm -hmm. When we asked about your choices matter, what are your favorite ways to see that visual visualized? Like, how, how do you know that your choices matter? It was the life and death consequences. So if your choices, y y people would die or live depending on what you cho chose to do. Right. You also really loved the butterfly effect, that visual cue that let you know that some choice that you made is going to have a, a lasting impact. And then you also really liked how you could evolve the characters' relationships. Um, 
We asked about uh, non-immediate consequences, like if you've made a choice and then further down the line, it's like, it's because you right, right. called that thing or it's because the, you didn't close that door. Known that now... versus unknown cause mm-hmm. and effect that yeah. I overcomplicated. Yes. Uh, cause and effect. You liked when consequences have an obvious effect after you've made the choice, but not before. So you don't want to know that like before you make the choice that this is going to have make someone die or live. You want right, right, right. to afterwards. If it, but if it does cause them to die, it wants, you mm-hmm. want it to happen. Yeah, and then you, wa- you want it to be obvious after the fact that which choice resulted in this consequence so that you don't feel so like you can you're... track it back mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. make a different choice. And make a different choice, exactly. So having a clear connection to the choices and the consequences. You also really loved the totems that gave you clues and a premonition to keep you a little bit more on the lookout and uh, helped keep the tension up overall. You also loved the visual clues so that you know that your your choices are having an impact um, like the butterfly. Yes. Um, <laughs> lore, you liked the shiny clues. I too like shiny that, things. That we can interact with further. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The environmental storytelling by looking around the space, you were learning about the character's history. You were learning about the mountain's history. You were learning about uh, what had happened there before. You also like to get your lore from talking to other characters, but you don't want them to monologue at you. Um, um, and then, like um, we are now. <laughs> um, and then you also like morally gray characters or ones that are good and evil but are in morally gray situations. Uh, the, your favorite game mechanic was the dialogue choices, followed by don't move and then interacting with clues for more information. But it's important for the quick times that they are part of an action sequence or a fighting sequence so that they're moving the story forward as opposed to just coming out of nowhere. And you're already on, on mm-hmm. the controls. When we asked about your favorite length for a narrative, you said between 12 to 15 hours um, with about five to 10 endings. So you want to really get into it and you want to have multiple options uh, for the yeah, story no, to no illusion of choice, but Mm-mm. real choice. Yeah. Um, and you want to be uh, having having some something that shows you what could be in the end, like uh, a hint of another outcome or showing other players' choice or a flow chart. And the final thoughts was that this game was really good at maintaining the tension of the relationships that you can either subvert or participate in tropes and cliches. Um, you also loved the co-op element of it and having the recaps so that it felt like act breaks. So, you know, you made this choice and this happened here. And then finally being asked questions by the therapist that it felt very personal. And having very different and diverse characters. Yeah. Team, this has been an incredible games club. We are very grateful for you joining us and we want you to know that next uh, streams will be for our finale of Mass Effect uh, Saturday and Sunday. And we are going to be doing a games club on Horizon Zero Dawn the Friday after next when we complete the Frozen Wilds DLC. And before we begin playing Forbidden West, we'll also be doing a games club on Life is Strange coming up on March 4th. And GCAT, hey. thank you for your awesome gift. I'm glad you are really enjoying the Games Club streams. We are too. Uh, oh, yes. It, it genuinely has given us a lot of mojo for our own project uh, and also just a new way of looking at video games and storytelling. Yeah. So uh, we totally agree with you. Mm-hmm. Vichelia, welcome back for 45 months and Bloody Shion, thank you for being here. I see Clarence G has subscribed with their Prime. We got to pull a winner real quick and yeah. then we're going to switch gears to a new game called Path of Exile, mm-hmm. which has uh, an extension or an expansion that just came out today called Siege of Atlas. Uh, So we're all going to create a character together uh, on the other side of our break. But first we have to pull a winner for our prize. A winner. So type a thing into the chat, anything at all, as long as it is fundamentally decent, you are entered to win this blue Yeti microphone. We will send it to you from somewhere around the world. Uh, We appreciate you all hanging out with us and uh, thank you all for typing in the chat. We'll give it a couple of seconds um, to find our winner, 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 winner. This is awesome. Thank you, team. So I many love good ideas. To see it. And Boku, thank you for subscribing with your Prime. Thanks for hanging out with us. Okay, and here we go. 
thank you, thank you, thank you so much for hanging out with us for these games clubs. I, I think that this has become probably one of my favorite streams that we do together. Um, I just love getting all of your input about these games and what makes them so special. Uh, so thank you so much for hanging out and for sharing your thoughts and uh, your insights because it's hugely, hugely uh, helpful. <laughs> very, very helpful. And the winner is for a Blue Yeti microphone. Ooh, Dryan, uh, Dryda, Dryda, am I saying Dryda. Right? Dryda Yt, and I think that means YouTube. Dryda oh. Yt, congratulations, you are the winner. Nice. Please keep an eye on your DMs. We're gonna send a message to you from Colorful Mess 18, our moderator in charge of prizes, to find out where we can send yours, and uh, we'll get that off to you this month. Uh, we send one of those out each month. Sweet, I'm very, very, very grateful for you all hanging out with us today. Um, this video will go up on YouTube, so if you missed any of the earlier stuff and you wanna watch it, uh, you can check it out on YouTube. And thank you again to our awesome, yes, you, congratulations. Um, thank you very much to our moderators and to our lieutenants. We appreciate you. Yes. Thank you for helping us on Twitch 